All right, keeping your Bibles open there, look at uh, verse number 8. So Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 8. It begins by saying, Will a man rob God? Will a man rob God is the title for the sermon this afternoon. And before I get into the sermon, I just want to say thank you for the men that covered uh, the church services on, on Sunday. It was a blessing to be able to get down to Sydney and see the brethren. I'm not seeing them for almost three months. Uh, so it's good to, to be there and fellowship with the guys and, and just to help them out with the, with, the, with the new building that they're meeting in at the moment. And uh, yeah, thank you for the preachers, you know, Jason and Sam, but also the song leaders, everyone else that helped out, uh, you know, just tying up the place. All, all the little things that you do is, is a real service to God. You know, you, you're, you're not just serving your pastor, you're helping your pastor out, but you're serving the Lord God, you're serving the brethren. And as we study through Malachi, uh, and you look, we look at this chapter, you'll notice how important our service is. You know, there, there are times that you're going to feel like uh, coming to church is, is vanity. You know, it's, it's empty. You know, it, is there any profit in coming to church? You know, it's a Wednesday night. I've, I've worked hard all day. It's been a long day. Maybe some of you travel. You know, I know some of you guys definitely travel a fair distance to be in church. And the, the question will come to your mind, is it worth it? You know, can we just skip that one service? You know, is it really worth it? And I think this chapter really points out the truth that it is definitely worth it. It is definitely profitable to be serving the Lord. Look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 1. It starts off by saying, Behold, I will send my messenger. And before I keep reading, that messenger here is actually a reference to John the Baptist. Now, just a reminder in, in you know, what we saw in Malachi chapter 1, chapter, chapter 2, were the Israelites pleasing the Lord? Were they doing well? No. Okay, They were doing horribly. You know, the, the Lord was not pleased with their service. The Lord was not pleased with the priests and the sacrifice and the ordinances that were being carried out. And so what is being told to this nation right now is that God will send his messenger. Hey, we're going to sort this out. If you can't sort it out, I'm going to sort it out. And I'm going to send my messenger. And what's amazing about the Christian faith is you would sometimes think, you know, for an entire nation to get right with God, you think you need all these people. You think you need this grand army or a great amount of people to stand up for the Lord. But quite often, it's the one messenger. And you know what? John the Baptist, one man, got that entire nation ready for Jesus Christ. Because we know just another 300, 400 years where Jesus Christ comes on the scene, the one that prepared the way of the Lord was John the Baptist. God can just use one man. One man to, uh, mean, uh, to win many hearts to the Lord. You know, one man to lead a church. Often it's just that one person. If you're willing to be faithful, if you're willing to be used by God, you can have a great influence on many people. And it says here, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. Okay, these are the words of God. He says he's going to prepare the ways before me. So who came after John the Baptist? Jesus Christ. And look at this. And the Lord, now the Lord here is referring to Jesus Christ, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to, the, to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. What, mes what message was Jesus Christ coming with? What covenant was he coming with? Well, the new covenant, right? The new testament. It says here, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Please keep your finger there and go to Matthew chapter 11. Go to Matthew chapter 11. And I just want to prove to you, of course, that this is a reference to John the Baptist when it said that I will send my messenger uh, and he shall prepare the way before me. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 7 says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, that's John the Baptist, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he, that's John the Baptist, of whom it is written. That's what we just read. What is written? Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And so Jesus Christ is pointing to that which, which was written in the book of Malachi. Hey, that was a reference of John the Baptist. And what's amazing about this, that in Malachi 3 verse 1, it says, He shall prepare the way before me. And then at the end of verse number 1, it says, Saith the Lord of hosts. And what is Jesus saying? That he came to prepare the way of Jesus Christ. You know what this is confirming for us? The deity of Christ. Hey, if these words are being said by the Lord of hosts, 
Who is the Lord of hosts? If John the Baptist came preparing the way before me, then Jesus Christ, who is the one that the way was prepared for, is that Lord of hosts. You know, quite often we talk about the deity of Christ. We turn to different passages of the Bible to, you know, uh, teach on the deity of Christ, that Jesus Christ is God. You know, this is another passage. We probably don't turn to it that often, right? But it's very clear that God is saying, John the Baptist is coming to prepare the way of the Lord. And of course, the Lord being Jesus Christ. Back to Malachi chapter 3, verse number 1. There's a lot of good nuggets of truth just in this one chapter. Because it says here, And the Lord whom ye seek... Hey, he's talking to a very wicked generation. He's talking to some very uh, wicked Jews right now. And who are they seeking in this time before the New Testament, before Christ is on the scene? Several hundreds of years, it says, And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. My question to you, brethren, is we're talking about here Old Testament saints, Old Testament Jews. Were they seeking Jesus Christ? Were they waiting for Christ to come? Absolutely, that's what God just says. And the Lord whom ye seek. You know this stupid teaching, this dispensational teaching that the Jews knew nothing of Christ. They knew nothing that he was coming on the scene, you know. And so how could they place their faith on Jesus if they did not even know he was coming? And then they'll start saying, well, maybe they were saved then by another gospel. Maybe they were saved by faith and works because they didn't know of Jesus. And yet God is saying to a wicked generation, Hey, you know the one you're seeking? Jesus, he's coming, and he's going to come suddenly to his temple. All right? And he's coming with the covenants. Okay? So did the Old Testament Jews know of Jesus? Absolutely. How can God say you're seeking after him if they did not even know about him? Okay? So this is just another confirmation here that the Jews were saved in the Old Testament. You know, the saints were saved in the Old Testament in the same way, by placing their faith on Jesus Christ, by seeking the Lord. It says here, whom ye delights. Okay, the messenger of the covenant, so we know what that covenant is. In fact, please take your Bibles, keep your finger there again in Malachi 3. Like I said, there's a lot of great nuggets of truth just in this one verse. Please go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. It says here, even the messenger of the covenant. What is this about? Of course, Jesus Christ coming, bringing in the new covenant. You guys go to Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah 31, 31, okay? Jeremiah 31, 31, which says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. That's a, that's a New Testament, the new covenant, right? With the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. So did they know that one day this old covenant will end and a new covenant will start? They knew that. That was being taught by the prophets. And Malachi again confirming this covenant is coming. Hey, the messenger of the covenant is coming. It says in verse number 32, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took uh, them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man, uh, teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I'll remember their sin no more. Okay? So this is what's special about this new covenant, of course, is that this sacrifice of Christ would pay for all our sins, where God can say that I will not remember their sins anymore. Why? Because it's all been paid in Jesus Christ. All the sins from the beginning, all the sins that are done by men till the very end have already been paid for in Jesus, so God can say I will not remember them. But when it comes to the sacrifices of the Old Testament, you know, yes, it was just a picture, but it never took away any sin. Okay? And so when God can look down to his saints, look down at his believers and say, I've forgotten your sins, your sins as far as, as, far as the east is from the west, it's because he's looking at the sacrifice of Christ not the sacrifices that were done under the old covenant. So this was a promise by God that there's a better covenant coming, a new covenant for Israel, for Judah, and in fact for the entire world. Okay? And everybody that is part of that new covenant, of course, makes up the spiritual nation of Israel. Right? The Israel of God. Now you're in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 24. 
speaking of this new covenant. So this again actually gets quoted for us in the book of Hebrews, what we just read in Jeremiah. But Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24 says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And so we see Christ is the mediator. He's the messenger of the new covenant. He's the mediator of the new covenant. Please go to Hebrews 13, verse 20. Hebrews 13 and verse 20. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that's bringing him back from the dead, his resurrection, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. That's amazing because the old covenant would wax old, the old covenant would end, but God promised this new covenant, which is the everlasting covenant. Okay, listen, it's done. Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, we rest in Him, we place our faith in Him, it's done. Praise God that God no longer remembers our iniquities through Jesus Christ. Praise God for that great truth. And so Malachi is, is our, you know, uh, or the Lord using Malachi is teaching this wicked generation of the Jews, hey, there's a new covenant coming. We're going to sort this out. You guys are in a mess. You're not doing things right. I'm going to send the messenger. Christ is going to come and we're going to bring in that new covenant because you've messed it up. You can't even, you know, you, you've broken that old covenant, you know. And so you can see a lot of great truths there just in that one verse. Please go to Malachi chapter 3 once again. Malachi chapter 3. And I think it's great because we do see how the Old Testament saints did definitely know about Jesus, definitely knew about the new covenant, definitely knew about the, the Lord that they seeked after. Okay, look at verse number two. Now, verse number two, I believe, must be understood with verse number one. Okay, when, when Christ came bringing in that new covenant, did he bring that in? When did he bring that in? Well, it came at his birth, right? He came in uh, at his birth, that was his mission, and that new covenant started at his death. Right? So we're talking about his first coming, aren't we? Okay? But here's the thing, and, and I've heard some teaching from the book of Malachi, and when the preacher gets to chapter 2, because of their dispensational lenses, they'll start saying this is about the second coming instead of the first coming. Okay? And I want to show you how they can really mess this up. Okay? We definitely know verse number 1 is about his first coming. Right? John the Baptist is actually coming, preparing the way of the Lord. Verse number 2. And who may abide... Uh, the day of his coming. So what day is it coming? You know, like I said, they might be thinking a second coming here. And then it says, And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. So I don't think there's anything wrong with taking this verse and maybe applying it to his second coming. But the context told us this is his first coming. All right? And what we see here is when Christ comes, he's coming like a refiner's fire. So if you're someone that's refining precious metals, gold and silver, you're trying to take out the imperfections, you're taking, taking out the impurities so it can be a very pure product. That's what Christ is coming. He's coming to refine, but he's also coming like a fuller's soap. And I wasn't really familiar with that term, a fuller. I looked it up. Basically, a fuller is a person. It's an old, old word that we don't really use today, but it's a person that worked with fabric. And so a fuller's soap is basically like an industrial soap. Something that's really harsh, it will take out the imperfections, it will take out the stains out of the fabric. And so Christ is coming to wash and to refine, okay? And of course, that's what he did, right? He comes to, to a generation that's very wicked, a generation that's very lost, a generation that is mixed up religiously, they, they don't have their faith on Christ, they, they've got their, you know, they're, they're following after the, the doctrines of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, and Christ comes and just fix things. You know, he makes the righteous more purified. You know, he comes and he cleanses us of our sins. He washes us as though he was with that fuller's soap. Look at verse number three. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, let's stop there for a moment. If this is about the second coming, now for those of you, that uh, obviously are maybe familiar with dispensationalism. I don't know how, how much, how familiar you all are. But basically, one of the teachings that really I find, you know, I find heretical, like completely heretical, not just heretical, but I, I almost look at it as blasphemy. And there's a teaching in, within the dispensational world that at the millennium, when Christ comes to rule and reign for a thousand years, that there will be a third temple set up. And that the Old Testament saints, or not the Old Testament, that the Jews will once again be offering sacrifices. 
That once again, they'll be, you know, uh, bringing animals and slaughtering those animals and the blood will be shed. It's like, what in the world? Don't you know that it's an everlasting covenant, the new covenant, that Christ is the ultimate sacrifice? It's done. Okay? And those sacrifices of old, they were great. They were great pictures of what Jesus would do. How can we say we'd go back to an old system that never worked? An old system that never uh, uh, forgave sins? An old system that just pointed us to Christ? How can you go back in the millennium? But that's what they think. They think this is about the second coming. And so Christ is coming at the millennium, at the third temple, and he's going to fix up the, the priesthood, and they're going to be offering sacrifices once again. Offering sacrifices once again. What in the world? You, know, you can see how, you know, when you take a verse and you apply it in the wrong place, how it can really bring out, you know, heretical teaching. You know, I remember hearing that and I'm just thinking, that is so wrong. Now, look, I, I, I would always look to honor my pastors, honor the men that would preach behind the pulpit, you know, respect them, you know, try to receive what they have to say, be willing to be changed, be willing to be humble. But when you hear this stuff, it just, it didn't mesh with the spirit of God that I had in me. Okay? It doesn't mesh with the Bible. In fact, like we saw in verse number 1, this is definitely talking about the first coming of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so when we talk about being purified, the sons of Levi, the priests, you know, many of the priests believed on Jesus. Many of the priests were made right. You know, when Christ came on the scene, they, you know, a lot of them did reject Him, but many did believe on Him. And so Jesus Christ came refining people. He came washing. You know, he came clearing up doctrine. He came uh, uh, teaching against false teachers and false doctrines. So he came, you know, refining. He came purifying. He came washing. And he did a great job at it, you know. John the Baptist before him and then Jesus Christ after him, after John the Baptist. You know, they, they did a great job uh, 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 washing that nation. And uh, in John chapter 15, I'll just read it to you very quickly. John 15 verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So why did Christ come in, washing, purifying? And so that nation, so the believers of him, would be able to bring forth more fruit. That they, could be, they could do more for the Lord. Okay? And in your life, as you seek to please the Lord, in your life, as you seek to do righteousness, as you seek to be fruitful, you'll find that Jesus Christ will come and work in your life and He'll prune you, He'll improve you, He'll help you so you can then do more for Him. You can serve Him or you can do more works for Him so you can bring forth more fruits. That was the goal of Jesus Christ, to take what faith there was at that point in time and make them more fruitful. And of course, we see the, we see the fruit of that. We see the souls saved. We see the churches that start. We see that the faith of Christ is taken globally rather than just being focused on that one nation, taken to the uttermost parts of the world. Verse number 4, Malachi chapter 3, verse 4. It says, Then shall the, and this is why they think, you know, the Old Testament sacrifice is coming back. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. You see, in the days of old, when they were doing things right, it did please the Lord. But remember, in the book of Malachi, what, what are they doing? They're doing it, but they don't care. Their heart's not in it. They're not doing things right, right? They're not giving their best, and so it's not pleasing the Lord. I hope you stayed in Hebrews. I should have told you to stay there. Please go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 4. So they read Malachi 3, 4, right? And say, so see, the Old Testament offerings. And basically, if you're confused between those words, offering and sacrifice, I don't know if you ever, they're really one and the same thing. They're saying, like, if you were to do an offering, you're, you're offering the sacrifice. You're bringing a sacrifice, right? And you're offering that sacrifice. You know, uh, the words offering and sacrifice are really are interchangeable, you know? It's just what, different elements. What, one is you're presenting it, and the sacrifice itself is the object that you're presenting, but it's the same thing, okay? So you can use these words interchangeably if, that, if you ever wondered about that. But see how it said in Malachi 3, 4, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be, uh, be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old. Well, when you look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 4, it says here, uh, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Now look at this, verse number 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. 
Oh man, they're going back to the Old Testament ways. They're going back to offering the bulls and the goats and the burnt offerings. So six, verse number six, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast, hast, had, uh, thou hast had no pleasure. It doesn't please the Lord. Once Christ has come and he's offered himself, his body as a sacrifice, there is no pleasing God with some other animal sacrifices. So when you read Malachi chapter 3, verse number 4, and it says, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord. How can you say some future time offering those sacrifices once again is going to please the Lord when we've got a black and white scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, saying that he can't please the Lord because Jesus Christ has now offered that final sacrifice. Okay, so, you know, I just want to teach you this because people will come and try to deceive you. You know, people come with their dispensational theology, and many of them mean well, many of them are sincere, but they've not studied their Bibles, they've not read their Bibles, they've just gone to Bible college, and they've just swallowed all the lies. You know, great truths in Bible college, I'm sure, but they've also swallowed a bunch of lies. And listen, I don't want to be a pastor, I don't want to be a preacher that's just regurgitating, you know, something in Bible college. You know, a preacher that just regurgitates an online preacher, you know, when we come and stand before the pulpit, we, we teach the Word of God, we've got to make sure we've done our own due diligence. And listen, when I hear this is about the second coming, I've got to stop and say, well, does this line up with the rest of the Bible? Or am I just going to repeat it like a parrot? You know, and it's important for us, you know, to make sure that this church, New Life Baptist Church, is always a church that the preacher is well studied, has spent time with the Lord, has looked for wisdom, so that way we can be teaching the truth the truth of God's word, right? And so the question then is, well, what offering then, right? Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 4. What offering could Judah and Jerusalem possibly do that pleases the Lord if it's not the, the bodies of bulls and goats? Well, we've covered this already in Malachi chapter 1. I, I don't want to rehash that entire sermon. But we talked about how in the New Testament, we do bring an offering. We do offer sacrifices in the New Testament. And the four main ones that I covered in when we looked at chapter 1, uh, was number one, praising God, you know, singing his praises, giving him thanks. Number two, fellowshipping with the brethren. In fact, the fellowship of the brethren comes in later on in this chapter. Uh, number three was Christian living, making sure our lives are pleasing to the Lord. You know, we're not just giving into sin, we're trying to live righteously. And number four, giving to the work of God, you know, giving financially, giving resources so the work of God can continue. Hey, this is, this is how we can offer our sacrifices now in the New Testament, and these things definitely please the Lord, okay? Malachi chapter 3, verse number 5, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 5 says, And I will come near to you to judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, that turn, <clears throat> and that turn aside the stranger from his rights, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So, what we see again, just, you know, I won't rehash chapter five, uh, verse number five too much, but again, just the fact that there are very wicked Jews at this point in time, right? I mean, but the Lord says that He is Lord and He doesn't change, right? The people change. The people become more wicked. The people depart from the Lord. The people aren't serving the Lord the way they, they, they ought to, but the Lord never changes. And this is one of those verses that uh, uh, basically, uh, it's one of those uh, uh, I guess like a pillar verse to the um, doctrine of the, I've forgotten the, the word of it, of it now. Uh, well, let's keep our fingers there. I, I remember when we turned there. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Ah, the immutability of God. The immutability of God. You go, what is that? Well, to be immutable is to be unchanging. You know, something that cannot be modified. You know, who God is today is who God will always be. You know, one reason why we reject, we reject modalism and oneness theology is because that teaches that God can change, yep. that, that God can be a hundred maybe. Why, why can't God be a hundred people? Why, why can't God be whatever? You know, but the, the Bible's very clear, God never changes. You know, Jesus never became the Son. He was always the Son. You know, the Father was always the Father. The Holy Spirit was always the Holy Spirit in eternity past, in eternity future, because He doesn't change. Okay, and if you can please, yeah, go to Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 17, Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 17, 
Say, well, that word immutability, that's a big word. Is that a Bible word? Actually, it is. Look at, look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 17. It says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set upon us. And so there are two things that are immutable when it comes to the Lord. It's, it's in verse number 17. It says, uh, referring to his counsel. Okay, that never changes. His counsel never changes. We, we can read the counsel of God in the book of Genesis. You know, some over 6,000 years ago. And you know what? It's still true today. We, we can read any book of this Bible, anything that God says that will please him. If we just step out in faith and do that, you know, God's going to be pleased. We know that whatever God says, it's not going to change. So you're still reading that book from 2,000 years ago. Amen. Yes, because it doesn't change. These are God's words. His counsel doesn't change. What else doesn't change? There in verse number 17, confirm that by an oath, what God oaths, what he promises never changes. And so if God has promised us everlasting life, we can rest in that and know it's never going to be taken away from us. Okay, so it's, it's, his, it's his counsel, it's his oath or his promises that never change. So not only does God never change, but even the things that he counsels, even the promises that he makes will never change, okay? And I love that about God because I've had friends that change, okay? And then they're your friends today, tomorrow they're not your friends. I probably have done that. I'm not perfect. You know, I've probably changed, right? And people don't like the changes in me. Hopefully those changes are because I've become more righteous. Hopefully those changes are because I've become more godly so people don't want anything to do with that side of your, you know, your life, your Christian living. And so, you know, people change. People will let you down. People will lie to you. People will make promises and not keep them. I've made promises and not kept them. Maybe I've disappointed you. But here's the thing, you know, we've got a God who never changes. A God who makes promises and keeps those promises. A God who gives counsel and that counsel will always be correct no matter what period of time you live in. You know, that's it's amazing. Some other passages, numbers, you don't need to turn there. Actually, it's in Hebrews. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. So God never lies. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he, <clears throat> hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and he shall not make it good? So whatever God promises, brethren, it's go he's going to come good. In fact, as we go through this chapter, there are things God promises and he says, I'm going to keep them. Okay. Let's keep, uh, what else do I have here? James chapter 1 verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Hey, if you have a good gift, if you've been blessed, if you have something and it's given you joy, you know who it's come from? It's come from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, our heavenly Father. Then it says this, With whom uh, is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Our Father is, or will always be our Father. He doesn't change. He looks down at our righteousness. He looks down that we're trying to live godly for Him and He's going to keep giving us gifts. He's going to keep rewarding us. Praise God for a God of love, a God who really wants to reward us when we walk faithfully after Him. Look at Hebrews 13 and verse number 8, and you probably all know this off by heart anyway. Hebrews chapter 13, <clears throat> verse number 8. It says, Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday and today and forever. Praise God for Jesus. The same yesterday, today, and forever. You know what that means? That means yesterday he was the Son of God. You know what I mean? That means forever he will be the Son of God. He didn't become the Son of God at his birth. He already was the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the same. He doesn't change. That's the God I want to worship. The God that I know, the, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is the same God that I worship today. He hasn't changed. The promises that he gave to Abraham are the promises that I can have if I'm in Christ Jesus. He hasn't changed. The promises are the same. His counsel is the same. Okay? The Trinity, it doesn't change. It doesn't go from 2 to 1 to 5 to 20 to 15. Whenever he likes, he's always Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay? This is a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Honestly, you move away from the Trinity, you no longer have Christianity. Okay, oneness theology is not true biblical Christianity, yeah. neither is modalism. <clears throat> Look at verse number, uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 7. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 7. <clears throat> Even from the days of your fathers, 
ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? You know, God's saying, Look, you've not kept the ordinance. We've already seen the exa- some examples, right? They're not serving the Lord properly, all right? And again, you know, it's easy to, to point fingers, right? So we need to think about ourselves all the time. All the time you hear these things. Think about yourself. Are you serving God properly? Are you giving your best? Are you giving God what He wants? And you know what? God's patient with us. He says, return unto me, and I will return unto you. But look at the attitude of, the, of these ungodly Jews here. But ye said, at the end of verse number 7, but ye said, wherein shall we return? They're saying, where did we leave you? Hey, we've been doing the sacrifices. <laughs> we've, been go- we've been going to church. Right? I mean, this is, this is, this is, we can be like that. I mean, go to church, God. You know, I, I've, I've been uh, reading my Bible, picking that up once in a while. I've been, I've been, you know, when, did, when did we leave you? You know, when your heart's not in it, when you're not giving your best, you've departed from God. And God wants you to return. God wants you to give His best. God wants you to serve Him. And then verse number 8, He says, Will a man rob God? Say, so, no, it's actually, it's impossible. It is impossible to rob God, right? I mean, God owns everything. And then the question is, well, yet you have robbed me. We can rob God. Even though God owns everything, everything is in His hands, we can still rob Him from a spiritual perspective, right? It says here, But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And God says very clearly, in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. This whole nation. We already knew that they were given offerings. We know they were given their sacrifices, but we saw they were bringing their, their, the maimed, you know, the blind. They were bringing their worst. So they were robbing, even though they were doing it, they were robbing God because they weren't giving their best. That's number one. But number two, they weren't giving their tithes. You know, they weren't giving their 10%. You know, the increase that God would give them on the land, they were not coming. Maybe they were giving 5%. Maybe they were given 1%. You know, they weren't given the 10%, the tithe that God had asked for them. And God says, you've robbed me, you know. And, uh, you know, this is a, a, a topic, I, I guess, as a pastor that's hard to preach on. Because, you know, what's the answer to this? Bring your tithes. You know, when it comes to the New Testament, uh, uh, the house of God, it's the church. It's the local New Testament church. The teaching on this is bring your tithe. When God blesses you, when you get your, your pay, when you get your paycheck, you know, when you get your increase, take 10% of that and say, well, God, this is yours. I don't want to rob you, God. This belongs to you. You've entrusted me to hold this, and so I'm going to now give that to the work of your local church. Amen. That's the tithe. You say, well, Pastor Kevin, it's because you want to get paid, don't you? It's because you're, you're hungry for money. Listen, I've never been poorer in my life. Honestly, you know, I, I've worked jobs where I was paid a little bit, I've never been paid as little as I do running two churches, you know, going back and forth between Sydney and the Sunshine Coast. I'm not doing this for money, okay? We don't give our tithe because the pastor is money. Well, there are pastors that are money hungry. There are definitely out there, right? But we give our tithe because we don't want to rob God, because God has blessed us. And this is the way God wants us to offer up our sacrifices, to give something, our service back to God. Look at verse number 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now God actually wants to bless us. He wants to reward us. He wants to open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. But He says, but you've got to tithe. You've got to step out in faith and give 10% of your increase. You might say, well, God, where's your blessing? Why aren't you giving me the things that I need? Why aren't you answering my prayers? Are you tithing? If you're not tithing, how can you expect the blessings of God? And listen, will God still bless you? Of course. The fact that you're saved, you're blessed. The fact that He's given you His Son, you're blessed. The fact that you know you go to heaven, that you've got a mansion there, you're going to be rewarded for the works that you've done. You've been blessed. Okay, New Life Baptist Church is a blessing. It should be a blessing to you. It's definitely a blessing to me. You know, being with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, you know, there's so much that God has given us. You know, my children are a blessing to me. You know, my health. You know, sometimes I talk to people who struggle with their health and I forget, well, just the little asthma, the little allergies that I suffer with every now and again doesn't compare to the suffering that other people have. I'm blessed even with my health, you know. God has blessed us with so many things. But look how God responds. He goes, look, bring it that there may be meat in mine house. So what he's saying is, look, If you bring your tithe, the house of God can do more. 
You know, we can do more works. We can be more effective if people brought their tithes. And if people aren't bringing their tithes, it's going to make us less effective. We're still going to have church. Don't worry about it, you know. All we need is a Bible and a place to preach. We're done. We can have church for sure, okay. But we can do more. We can be more effective. We can do more works for God if people bring in their tithe. And, you know, one of the benefits of this coronavirus, it doesn't really touch onto the tithing, but people have been given to our church that aren't even visiting our church, who don't attend our church. And so Brother Matthew right now is trying to work out, hey, let's organize some live streaming. You might see the monitor he's got on his desk. He's trying to get that organized, right? There's a bit of a cost to get that happening. Hey, but the cost that's coming in from people that aren't even in our church is going toward the work of live streaming. We're going to dedicate all that money to an internet uh, ministry, okay? Now, that's not our primary ministry. That's a secondary thing, okay? But God has blessed us with other people that want to give to our church, and we're going to bless them back. We're going to have an online ministry. We're going to do the live streaming, okay? So people can see, you know, for those that maybe are sick and can't come to church or people that are living in places in Australia where they have no good church, at least they can be blessed in this way. But why can we do that? Because people are giving, right? So the more we have coming into the church, the more we can do for church, right? And God makes it very clear, not only that, not, not, not only that there be meat in my house, but then he says, and prove me now herewith. God says, look, prove me. Can you prove me? Can you trust me? I want you to bring your tithe because I want to bless you. That's what God says to you, right? Bring it. Say to the Lord of us, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Hey, we already saw that God doesn't change. His promises do not change, right? His counsel does not change. Oh, this has changed in the New Testament. He just told us he doesn't change, okay? That means if you bring your tithe, he's going to bless you. You say, well, I've been tithed, and how come my bank account's not getting bigger? God blesses us in many, many ways. You probably, don't even, you probably wouldn't even have what you have today if you weren't tithing in the first place, you know? The Bible tells us in Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. Listen, you know what? If you don't tithe, you know what you need? You need to learn to trust the Lord. He says, listen, that 10% belongs to me. Take it to the storehouse. Take it to the house of God and prove me, God says. This is not Pastor Kevin saying that. This is what the Lord God is saying, okay? And listen, I've been tithing since I first heard the doctrine, and I can say as a testimony that God comes through, that God provides. You know, if you can't see, and I'm not boasting, please, but if you can't see how a man on a single income with 11 kids can make it in Australia, all right? And he gives his tithes, then I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. You know, God has blessed me. You know, I was just down in Sydney yesterday. Uh, I was catching up with a friend uh, for breakfast. A friend that I've not seen for a few years. He's not, he's not from Blessed Hope Baptist Church. He's from one of my old churches. Catching up with him, uh, he had uh, just finished building his house. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I just, he's been trying to work on that for many years. There's been a lot of sacrifice, a lot of overtime, a lot of hard work, a lot of stress. I wanted to catch up with him. And, uh, you know, he was over the moon. They were able to achieve what they achieved. You know, they're in a good place financially. Not just that, but he's working a job that's closer to home. It's better hours for him, you know, and, and uh, his life's going really well. Okay, his life is going really well. And I was just saying to him, you know, well, you know, it's that hard work, brother, you know. It's the fact that you were willing to sacrifice and work hard and, and make something for yourself, provide for your family. Now you're, you're, you're enjoying the fruits of your labors. And you know what he said to me? I wasn't expecting him to say to me. He goes, yeah, but you know why? He goes, because I've been tithing. He goes, you know what? I've never forgotten to give my 10% to church, to give it to the Lord. And I know, I know that it's because of that that I have what I have today. You know, I was saying to him, hey, you worked so hard. He says, no, 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 it's actually because I just gave my tithe. <laughs> now, of course he worked hard, of course, all that stuff, right? He does, you know, but, you know, and it went well with, with the fact that I'm going to preach on this today. But, you know, he was telling me, you know, the testimony, he goes, look, if I didn't tithe, I know I would not be where I am today. You know, where so many things happen, so many, you know, we'd pray to the Lord and he'd just answer our prayers. The time was perfect. It all just came together for him. And he goes, because I know I was tithing. That's why. I was like, man, praise God. I'm going to use that testimony for the sermon tomorrow as <laughs> well. I just thought in my mind, right? But that's what he said to me. I wasn't expecting him to say that. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 11. Malachi chapter 3, verse 11. And look, if you don't tithe, you're not letting me down. I, I, it's not between you and me. It's between you and God. If you don't tithe, you're letting God down. If you don't tithe, you're robbing God. Okay? 
And I, I don't, you know, I don't want you to think I'm saying that because I'm the pastor. I, honestly, God has proved to me, and he's proved it to my friend that I spoke to yesterday. You give your tithe, the Lord's going to take care of it. The Lord's going to bless you. The Lord's going to open the windows of heaven and pour out his blessing. Verse number 11. And not only a blessing, not only can God give you things, but look at verse number 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast the fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So if you give your tithe, not only will God return uh, and, and bless you, but he will also rebuke the devourer. Say, who's the devourer? Well, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. I believe the devourer here is referring to the devil. You know, the Bible also says in Revelation 12, 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Of course, that's the, the de devil's attempt to kill Jesus Christ. And the Bible refers to him as trying to devour the child. You know, as a roaring lion, this lion is seeking to devour us. And so we can definitely think that, you know, the devil is trying to make our lives difficult. The devil is definitely trying to take things away from us, put us in difficult positions. And by tithing, God is saying, I'll even protect you from the devourer. Not just give you things, but protect you from losing things. But also, you know, I was looking at this word devourer. It's not just the devil, but even protection from false prophets. In Matthew 23, verse 14, Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. And so, you know, false prophets can devour you. And you know what? You give your tithe, the Lord says, I'm going to protect you from the devourer. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 20 says, For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, this is referring to some false prophets that the church in Corinthians had allowed them to come in. It says, If a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. You know, the Lord can protect you from false prophets, from false doctrines, from, you know, from, destroy, from hurting your spiritual life by you just tithing. There's a lot of benefits. There's a lot of blessings that come together with this. But you know what? Not only is a devil a devourer, not only are false prophets devourers, but sometimes your own fellow brother or sister in the Lord can devour you. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Praise God. That's how we should treat one another. Love thy neighbor as thyself. But then it says in verse number 15, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You know what? Will you ever have conflict in church? You definitely. I've had conflict in church. Um, you probably have, okay? Unless you don't want to, you know, better keep that secret, right? But we've all had some type of conflict, right? And we can bite one another. We can devour one another as brothers and sisters. But you know what? You give your tithe, the Lord's going to protect you from being devoured. You know, not just by the devil, not just by false prophets, but even by your own brethren in your church. You can go to church and just be happy. And be like, you know what, you know, I get along with people, I'm not in constant strife, I'm not in constant conflict, you know, just by giving your tithe. You know, these are all blessings of God. It's not just how big my bank account is. It's just living a, a happy life. You know, maybe your car lasts you longer than it should. My dad was telling me he's driving his, his hybrid car, which has a battery as well as a, you know, a, a electric battery. And he's saying, look, this was meant to last like five years or something like that. It's like, it's like 10 years and it's still going, right? I mean, that would be an example of God's blessing. You know, when normally the manufacturer says, oh, that needs to be replaced after five years, you know, it's going to stop working. It was still driving for 10 years, it's still going, right? So, you know, the blessings can come in many, many shapes and forms. You know, don't think about your bank account being the blessing. In fact, you know what? If you've got your heart just set on your bank account, how big that is, you're going to have a depressing life. I mean, money is a tool, and you know what? There's always something to spend that money on. There's always a new bill. There's always some other expense that comes up. You know, that's not where you seek to be blessed. You seek to bless the Lord, and the Lord will bless you in return. Malachi chapter 3, verse 12. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 12. <clears throat> it says, And all nations, this is still in, in, in light of the, the context of tithing, and all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome, delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. And so this is an example, you know, if you give your tithe, other people are going to look at your life and say, wow, 
that person's blessed. The Lord has looked after that, brother. The Lord has looked after that, sister. You know, people on the outside can see that you're thriving because God has blessed you. You know, this is all under the umbrella of tithing. Look at verse number 13. It says, your words have been stout against me. Stout means hardened toward God. So they say hard words toward God. You know, that they've lifted themselves up against the Lord. <clears throat> verse, sorry, I'll read it again. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Look at verse 14. So how do we speak against the Lord, right? And God says, verse number 14, ye have said it is vain to serve God. You know, if you ever think it is vain, it is empty to serve God, that's you being stout against God. That's you being hardened against God. That's you speaking against God. Listen, if an opportunity opens up for you to serve in the church, to serve the brethren, take it. It's not vain, okay? And when you think it's just not profitable, I'm not getting anything out of this, that's when you speak against the Lord, okay? Because the Lord has promised there is, there is profit, you know, I already mentioned Brother Matt, but, you know, I just saw him, you know, I came in from Sydney, come in here, Matt's trying to set up the live streaming stuff, right? He's taking time out of his own, you know, to, to travel here twice, I guess, to the same place, right? And, uh, you know, I, I know he doesn't want that recognition, I, I know that. But, you know, this is an example of someone coming in, nobody knowing, right? Nobody knows, but the Lord knows. And I assume Brother Matt thinks, well, this is, this is profitable. You know, this is not vain, okay? Serving the Lord is profitable. The Lord will bless me. And, uh, uh, look at verse, verse number 14. Let's keep going. It says, And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And so listen, there is profit. There is profit in serving the Lord. Okay? And let me tell you, if you have a ministry in this church, you find a ministry, you don't know, you might say to me, Pastor Kevin, what can I do to serve the Lord? I'll find something for you to do. I'll find something for you to do. Okay? If you can't figure something out, let me tell you, it's going to profit you. You know, you're serving the Lord God. Okay? It's not vanity. And you'll be pleasing the Lord. I, I would really encourage you to just be open. Look for opportunities where you can serve one another. You know, when I, uh, before I became a pastor, I was looking for every opportunity to serve God. Whatever it was, you know. I, would, I just said to God, God, whatever my pastor says to do, I'm just going to do it. Even if, I, even if I don't really want to do it. I'm just going to do it, Lord, because I want to serve you. I want to serve the body. I want to get experience, you know. I, I knew it was going to be profitable for me one day when I become a pastor you know, so I can, I can learn. And, you know, I was taking up Sunday school, you know, every week for three years, every week preparing a lesson, you know, for the Sunday school children. And not only that, but every month having an opportunity to preach to my church, I took that up, you know, serving as a deacon behind the scenes, you know, and understanding, you know, how a church operates, you know, serving the Lord in that capacity, serving the Lord in cleaning the church, in mowing the lawns, whatever it was, you know. And my pastor would say, hey, we've got a, a church picnic coming on. And instead of me being able to enjoy it, he's like, can you put on some activities for the kids? Can you organize that stuff? So instead of being able to enjoy the picnic, I'm out there working. And I didn't care because I'm serving God. I'm serving the brethren. And I know it's profitable because I know if I didn't do that, I'd probably still be saying, when am I going to be a pastor? Lord, when are you going to give me the experience? When it when come, when comes, when those opportunities present themselves, please remember it is profitable. God will help you. God will use you so you can grow, so you can serve Him. Verse number 15. And now we call, the, and now we call that the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up Yea, they that tempt God are, are even delivered. And so, obviously, the, the Jews here are proud, okay? And people are saying, well, you know, it, you're doing well. You know, they're, they're saying basically to the wicked, you're doing well. But you know what I thought about this as soon as I saw this? And we call the proud happy. Where does your mind go when you hear that? The sodomites, absolutely. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 8.13, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Does God hate Absolutely. What are the things that he hates? Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Does God hate pride? Absolutely. Hey, when the sodomites, when the homosexuals march down the road, what do they say? Gay pride. They say we're proud of the way we are. We're proud of the way we live. And what do they call themselves? Gay. Happy. So what it says here, and now we call the proud happy? Hey, they were just as wicked as our generation is. As Australians are today, when those, when those homosexuals go and march, you know, the Mardi Gras in Sydney, whatever it is, whenever that is, 
You know, in the United States, this month right now, you know, Gay Pride Month or whatever they call it. You know, we think about how wicked our, our nation has become. Well, you know what? The, the Jews, they were wicked. They were calling the same thing. They were calling uh, the proud happy. That's exactly what our nation has done. Anyway, that's off topic. But, you know, there's always a good time to kick that dog, right? <laughs> verse number 16. Verse number 16. Listen, when we get to verse number 16, there's a shift, there's a shift of tone. We've seen the wickedness, we've seen how badly they've treated the Lord. But then in verse number 16, there's always a righteous few. There's always a few that are serving the Lord faithfully. And this is what we see in verse number 16. So what we want to be, well, we don't want to be the others that we just covered, but we want to be verse 16. We want to be verse number 16, we want to be verse number 17. It says here, verse 16, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. That's what we should be. We should be people that fear the Lord. We should be people that speak often one to another. That's fellowship. Remember how I said that fellowship is an offering, a sacrifice that we can give to the Lord, that the Lord delights in? Well, look, when we fellowship, when we talk to one another, this is why you know, we need to be in church because it allows us that opportunity to come together. You know, we can't always visit one another's homes, right? But one thing we definitely can do is get together for church. And if we speak to one another, it says, and the Lord hearkened. The Lord listens when we communicate. So doesn't that give you some thoughts? Well, I better be careful what I say to my brethren. I better make sure that what we talk about is, is you know, profitable, is good, right? Not just complaining, not just whining, because the Lord is listening. The Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord. You know, when we fellowship and we talk wholesome things and good things, the Lord writes it down. He's got like a diary about the things that people talk about. The book of remembrance written there, right, right, right there. I don't know. I don't know if one day we'll read that book. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember we had the discussion. And we talked about that back in 2020 before the pandemic. Well, the Lord wrote it down, <laughs> right? But it's, listen, when we, when we fellowship, We've got to make sure that it's quality stuff that we talk about. Because look, it says at the end of verse 16, and, and that thought upon his name. So when we communicate, when we talk, when we fellowship, we need to make sure we're thinking of his name. We're thinking about the Lord. Okay? We're, we're trying to talk about spiritual things. We're trying to edify one another. You know, it's not just, you know, just speaking of, of worldly things. And you know, I used to get frustrated because I'd go to church, and then after the service, all we talk, and that, sometimes we talk about sport, but very rarely, right? But, he, you know, I'd go to church and there's a sermon. I get with my mates, I get with different people. And it's like, hey, did you see the game? You know, hey, what, what do you, you know, what's up with work? And it's like, well, I'm at church. I can talk about those things with anybody else. I'm supposed to be in church with my brothers and sisters. And Lord, I want to talk about the Bible. I want to talk about God. I want to talk about how God is using you, how God, you know, a testimony from your life. How has God blessed you? You know, and so let's think about our, our, our fellowship. Think about the things we discuss with one another. You know, are we speaking spiritual things? Are we speaking about things that God will want to write down in His book of remembrance? Or are we just talking about nonsense? You know? So let's make sure that our, our fellowship is quality. Verse number 17. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that they, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So the Lord thinks of His righteous as these jewels. I don't know if it's a jewel for His crown, but what I thought about when, he, when I read that was uh, what, what uh, Paul says, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? He says, What is my crown of rejoicing? He says, Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And so Paul was able to see the Thessalonian church, his brothers and sisters in the Lord, as they faithfully served him. And he says, You know what? You, the people, that's my crown of rejoicing. That's what I enjoy. That's what uplifts me. And so I see that same at, uh, attitude or the same characteristic in the Lord. You know, when we're serving Him, when we're fearing Him, when we're fellowshipping together, the Lord looks at us as His jewels. You know, if you have jewels, you're going to put it in a safe, you're going to protect it, you're going to, you know, make sure nobody steals from it. You know, it's, and, and that's how, how God sees us if we're faithful toward Him, we're serving Him, and etc. Look at verse number 18. Let's end there. Verse number 18. Then shall ye return. Now the ye here is not talking about the righteous. It's talking about the, the wicked. Because if you look at verse number uh, 16, it says, Then they that fear the Lord. So the they here are actually the righteous. Look at verse number 17. And they shall be mine. That's the righteous. So they. But then it says, Then shall ye return. So he's going back to the first people he spoke to, the wicked. 
He says, Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. So what he's saying is one day the wicked, those that have been unfaithful to God, will one day be able to look at the situation, I don't know if this is a day of judgment, potentially, where they'll be able to distinguish between those that serve God righteously and those that were wicked. You know, maybe they were praising the wicked. Maybe there were people behind the scenes serving God they never knew, and they were the righteous. They were the ones that were being blessed by God. And in conclusion, I just thought about, you know, Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. You don't need to turn there. And it says in Revelation 3, 9, it says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So one day these wicked Jews, right, these unsaved Jews will be able to look at all the believers from all nations and they're going to have to recognize, hey, you are the true Jews. You are the true Israel. You are the ones that Jesus Christ loved. Okay. And, you know, let this be an encouragement for us. I don't know how many enemies you have. I don't know how many people hate your faith, hate your Christianity, that may try to tear you down. You know what? On the Day of Judgment, they're going to be able to look at you and say, wow, God loved that person. God blessed that person. You know, that person was righteous. You know, all this time I tear them apart. You know, I brought them down. I thought they were wicked. I thought they were foolish. I thought they were stupid. One day, your enemies will have to acknowledge that you were the one that God loved. Why? Because you served Him, because you were righteous, because you were saved, because you offered your sacrifices to the Lord. Let's pray.